Uh, so with that, we'll get started. Rabbi Shali Sadri was Sadri Amri. It's still in the first three days of Ramadan, so I can still say Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Kareem. I hope your Ramadan is going well, and I, 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 it's a time of celebration and happiness for you and your families. Um, today, inshallah, as we continue our conversation about major themes in the Quran, uh, remember this is a, a series in which we're trying to understand what are all of the major themes in the Quran. Uh, but going through it while actually consuming parts of the Quran. So we've divided it up into eight parts. I'm not going to go through the review once again. Um, but the first of the major themes is uh, uh, the theme of uh, God or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slash what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expect us, of us slash how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala work. That's the three or four topics that I wanted to address um, in with the selection of the first few um, uh, passages from the Quran. And uh, as I was reading, one really stuck out to me. One group of ayat stuck out to me that was Surah Al-An'am, towards the end of Surah Al-An'am. Uh, it's the sixth surah of the Quran. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yay, share screen is working today. Okay. Um, so it's the uh, sixth surah of the Quran. And it's a surah that really... I could have chosen so many different parts of it, but it really gets into the creative power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, when we talk about nature, um, which is one of our major themes, like uh, that, what does nature tell us about, uh, or why does the Quran have such an emphasis on, on nature? Because it's supposed to be a sign for us. By observing nature was a way to understand how you're supposed to behave. So we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to talk about Surah Al-An'am a lot. But actually towards the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example and the mentality of someone who properly appreciated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is literally like the archetype human being. We can make the argument that Ibrahim alayhi salam is uh, as central to our tradition as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, his name is not in the shahada. Um, you still say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that never changes. But even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told that um uh, anta ala millati Ibrahim, that you are upon the way of Abraham. Um so Abraham is really seen as this human being who had it figured out, he appreciated God for who God is. So what I really wanted to get through in uh, uh today's brief um uh, conversation was actually the last ayah, uh 165, but due to my own weakness, I can't present the last ayah without going through the ayat that lead up to it. Because the Quran is, at the end of the day, a cohesive conversation. To just take one sentence doesn't make a lot of sense. So we have to look at the paragraph um, that preceded almost like that drop mic moment. Uh, uh, so with that, we'll, we'll jump right in, inshallah. Um, uh, actually, we won't just jump right in. One more point I wanted to make is yesterday with Ayat al-Kursi, Remember, our whole goal was understanding who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I could sum it up, it was that Allah is so close to you, your beloved, the one who takes care of all of your smallest and tiniest needs, and you can approach Allah for with anything. But wa huwa al azim but is also the one who owns the entire universe, who owns everything. So you need to have respect and authority. That's kind of the... Um, how I would summarize Ayat al-Kursi and of course the logical argument that built was a lot more than that in terms of um, how you're supposed to approach it and why it's seen as like the epitome or the thesis of Surah Al-Baqarah is every story talked about how different people appreciated or didn't appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for who Allah is and it built up until finally Allah said by the way this is me and we get the ayah of uh, Ayat al-Kursi and then the surah continues again with if you want to keep that up in um, your behavior, these are now commands. And we'll get to that once we get into uh, the Muslim community at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah after Ayat Al-Kursi really gets into the last theme that we'll talk about, which is the behavior that uh, uh, a community needs to have in order to maintain a proper relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the theme of the last um, uh, section of Surah Al-Baqarah. Um, and one of the challenges with a series like this is uh, we're trying to get through the content of the entire Quran within 30 days. That's really hard to do. So of course, we're going to have to paint with broad brushes at certain times. Um, but the reason I chose to do it the way we are is we do get to zoom in on specific parts and hopefully do some degree of justice to them while giving these overall summaries as well. So um, trying to speak in layers here. <laughs> 
Um, but now getting into today's ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we'll do this one maybe ayah by ayah, um, though I will randomly stop because I just get distracted by the point that's being made um, in, in the ayah as it is. Uh, Actually, I'm going to do it section by section because I just got distracted. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I can't keep this thought away. Um, the one who comes with a good deed will be rewarded tenfold. Um, love this for so many different reasons because remember these ayat are going to put forward again what is Allah's expectation of us because eventually Allah will say this is someone who got it is going to be Ibrahim this is someone who understands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but before getting into this is someone who understands Allah Allah says by the way you should know if you come to me manja bring me bil hasanati with I know the translation says with a good deed but actually it's not. It's al-hasanati. Al-hasanati means def- definitive, meaning the good deed. The reason I think that's so sp- special is sometimes we do a good deed or something and we're like, it's so tiny. Like, what's the point of that? What's who? Like, I remember certain years calculating my zakah for the year was like two dollars. <laughs> that tells you what my financial situation those years were. <laughs> and you look at it, you're like, is this even a a thing, but remember, Allah SWT, man jaa al-hasanati, who comes with the good deeds. It's that important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you do it. فَلَهُ عَشَرُ أَمْثَالِهَا And Allah will add 10 to it. Allah will multiply it by 10. We're in the month of Ramadan. I know people sometimes go through this like crazy calculation where like in the month of Ramadan, uh, things are seven times as uh, one good deed is worth seven in any other month. So that means it's that, and in one narration, 70 times. And every good deed anyway is 10 times. So every good deed I do is 700 times um, greater than a normal deed. Uh, I've even had someone tell me, so does that mean that if I pray, like, and they did the calculation or something like three d- days in Ramadan, that means it's equivalent to prayer of the whole year. And I'm like, no, that's not what that means. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, we shouldn't look at good deeds as like you're buying your way into Jannah. This isn't an economic transaction between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no like, if I do this many deeds, it doesn't matter what, I can just buy my way into Jannah. That it, That's not how it works. And that's one of the major things I want us to appreciate about this ayah, or that's why I chose this passage, is that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even seems to be looking at. Because when you look at so many narrations of people who earn Jannah, they will have done a life of sin. There's the one that comes off of a woman in Bani Israel who did a life of sin. But when she was in her last moments, she was trying to drink some water and she saw that there was a dog who was thirsty. And she thought, the hadith actually goes into the specifics. She thought to herself, just like I am thirsty, that dog is thirsty. So let me give him water before I drink. And when she gives him water, and apparently that was the last moment she had left. Allahu Akbar. Maybe she died of dehydration. I, I, I don't know what the actual cause is, but um, the angel of death meets her and she's given direct passage into Jannah. And it's like that deed of giving water to the dog, that was enough to prove her submission. Because that's at the end of the day, what we're doing is what is our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So is it do I have to calculate everything out? Not necessarily. Am I saying it's wrong to calculate things? No, that's not it either. Because you should be um, watchful of your prayer, meaning that if you've missed a prayer, make it up. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying not to do that. We're supposed to do that because that makes you, uh, that's proof that you're mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you're getting to the point where you're thinking that I can just go into Jannah because of uh, uh, my actions, we have narrations completely to the contrary of that, where there's a man who goes up on the day of judgment and will say, uh, uh, well, Allah subhanahu wa will say, because of my mercy, you're entering Jannah. And the man goes, because of your mercy, what about all of my deeds? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, um, would you like to be judged by your deeds instead? And he said, yes, because he's pretty proud of his deeds. And his deeds are placed on the scale. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
um, uh, your deeds have granted are in, are almost enough to grant you uh, um, the reward of that one time you blinked in your life and like there was moisture in your eye and it felt like, like a good blink. You've earned it. The guy's like, can, can, can I have your mercy again? I'm paraphrasing, of course. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns with mercy and he's given admission into Jannah. Um, to the point where the Prophet said, all of us, all, everyone who will be reliant on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Um, I have to appreciate this companion because of the guts he had to ask. But this companion asks, even you, Ya Rasulullah, even you, O Messenger of God, are you going to be reliant on the mercy of Allah? And the Prophet says, yes, I will be reliant on the mercy of Allah. Um, Allahu Alam, we, the Prophet was a very humble character to begin with. So Allahu Alam, whether that's the, a theological statement or not, but it still shows, goes to show that this idea of you can do something to enter Jannah or like you're trying to buy your way through your actions or through your deeds into Jannah, not very well founded. This ayah seems to suggest that as well. If if you do a good deed, you don't count it as one. In Allah's eyes, it could be 10. And the Ashara uh, is um, chosen in this way, from my understanding, or Amthaliha, um, is because 10 is just an example. It's just going to be increased because sincerity can literally increase um, a, a deed to such a high extent. I remember actually we got the question a little bit ago, of, is it better, I, I, I was stating, is it better to listen to the Quran or to recite the Quran? And I still stand by the answer, it's better to recite the Quran, but w someone listening to the Quran might be better than 50 people reciting the Quran because of how much of an effort it was or how impactful that listening was. So we could say on a general basis, but the actual worth that is it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't, we have no idea. And that's why, like, this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to judge you on an objective scale. You're, you can walk in with the same actions as someone else, and your rank will be different than the other person's rank because your situation was different. Because Allah is the most just at the end of the day, but not just the most just, just Allah's on your side. Because because of the uh, conversation that comes after. And whoever comes with the sin, not just a sin again, because every sin is impactful in terms of the effect it has on you and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa But whoever comes with the sin, um, they won't be given anything except what it was worth. And there won't be anyone who is wronged on that day. It'll be completely just. What does this tell us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah, you, you should have a bit of fear that like, if I come in with sins, oh my gosh, like I'm going to get the recompense for it. That's true. You should be mindful, but Allah's on your side. Because what did Allah say? A good deed, 10. A sin, you'll get what it deserves. There's, there seems like, again, this is uh, Allah Ta'ala is a judge at the end of the day, but is a judge who really wants you to succeed. You know how sometimes there's those teachers who like, they're going to grade you because if they don't grade you, like you're not going to learn. They need to grade you, but they're looking for any reason to like make it so you got it right. Um, if they saw some level of critical thinking, like, ooh, that was good. Your conclusion was completely wrong, but I like the way that sentence sounded. 10 more points. Like it's, uh, that's the that's the approach that I'm, I'm I I personally get is Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala is fair. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala is not will never have injustice, but it's a fairness and a justice that has on top of it a massive amount of mercy. Um I've been talking for a while. What do you guys think when you just read one uh ayah 160? The fact that one good deed is 10 and one bad deed is one, right? Basically. And we still have like that example you gave where we still need to be completely reliant on Allah's mercy. It doesn't, it's it like the, the beautiful part of it is it, it sounds like it's hard to get, it, it sounds like it's easy to get into Jannah. But the only reason why it's easy is 
because we have the mercy of Allah one, because one deed is 10. And also the additional mercy that we're given on the day of judgment. Yeah. So. I think that's an accurate, what your statement has behind it is in my opinion, like a very accurate uh, um, picture. And that is that like, it's easy, but I need the mercy. It's easy because I need to rely on Allah. Like that's actually, I would say that's a completely appropriate um, uh, way, way of going about it. Um, Shurban, I see you asked the question, what's the difference between a sin and a sin? Oh, that's sin and a sin. Oh, okay. Um, you, uh, Allah is not considering it as, it's just a little sin. Like Allah is not discounting the idea that a sin was committed. And in this case, sayi'ah is used. Um, sayi'ah is a different sin than uh, jurm. Jurm is a, har- a sin that harms someone else. Uh, sayi'ah is typically when you miss a mark. It actually is the idea, or and actually that's khataya. Sayi'ah is when you, uh, oh, uh, you were impaired in judgment of some sort. That uh, not that you missed the mark, your intention wasn't there. Sayi'ah is you, you literally weren't capable of doing the right thing in that moment. Um, but even then, uh, what is it? Yajza mithlaha, wahum la yadlumun. Allah is not going to be uh, um, un- unfair in any way. No one's going to be wronged. Um, but I hope that helps. That the sin is is huge because it's. I've I've heard this conversation before where don't look at the action, look at who you did it against. And sayya is typically it's something that's done against Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You didn't fill one, fulfill one of Allah's rights. That helped. Thank you. I remember um, uh, one time someone said, explain this to me that, um, you know, like they, they were having this like really com- like, complex uh, discussion about, or they were about to have this like discussion about free will and predestination. Mm-hmm. And then someone's like, you know, forget, all, forget about that. And they're like, um, you know, the only reason, like, you know, they said that, um, that, uh, that, that you know whatever good deed you do like you are set up in like every way to do that good deed so like so like there's no way and there's no way that you can attribute it to yourself yeah yeah that, that's one way of looking at it that you are reliant at the end of the day it comes down to how you respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there'll be some people who have the opposite that we were set up to do something wrong the entire way but then the argument could be but you you could have turned away and imagine the good deed you could have had then, right? So it's, it, it, it does work out to be fair at the end of the day. Um, I, I saw this was written on the, on the chat by uh, Hannah and I, I've been through something uh, similar. I remember uh, back in my undergrad, uh, I took, uh, what is that? Biochem, probably amongst the hardest classes I've ever taken. And uh, I didn't study much with my bio classes. I didn't like uh, struggle much with my bio classes except for this one. And I remember once I was uh, traveling that morning before so my flight was delayed. It was like, I just made it literally in class to take the test. And I took a test and I got like a 30 on it or like it was a ridiculously low score like in the twenties or thirties out of a hundred. And I was so embarrassed when I was even turning it in cause I was like, I know I did that. And when the test grades were being given out that day um, my, my professor, um, I, I still make dua for her, even though she's, she's not Muslim, but, uh, she put, put my paper down and I kind of just like kept it like upside down. Um, and I kind of peeked in while everyone else was looking at it. Everyone else relatively did well. And right after class, like I, I got the, I went up and I just like, I was like, I, before I could even open my mouth, she's like, yeah, we're not counting that test. I'm like, what? He was like, we're not counting that test. I was surprised you even made it to class that day because I told her that I probably wasn't going to be able to make it, but I ended up making it. Uh, I sent an email from the airport. And I, just, I was uh, surprised you even made it to class that day. We're not counting that test. This is what we're going to do. Whatever your next test is, I'm just going to double it. I got like an 89 on the next test. And it counted as my previous test. And I, I was just like, that's someone who wants to be fair in terms of like, no, you did, you did poorly. So you're still going to have a trial, but is rooting for you the, the whole time. And like, subhanAllah, if that's, if people can show that level of kindness, what level of kindness can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show? Um, 
someone who's literally your ila wants you to succeed is in charge of your development um so like, i like just put I, I like sharing that example because it always hits me anytime i see you about the mercy I'm like yeah i've experienced just mercy before um and just mercy is amazing you they literally have an impact on you and that's what we should always try to do as well when we provide for our family members or people around us um never let go of justice justice is necessary but justice tempered with mercy that's also like what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, uh, uh, presented to the companions of the Messenger them. If someone did something wrong, they would know about it, but it would be a merciful justice. Um, that's what we need to aim to always uh, implement. Um, I'm going to read the comment by Sara because I see Imam Mendi's on there and I love him so much. So I, I didn't even read the whole thing, but I'm going to read it anyway. I remember one time Imam Mendi's gave an amazing khutbah about this topic and he was talking about how you don't earn your way into Jannah. You only go to Jannah because you are veiled. Oh, uh, you only go into Jannah because you are veiled by Allah. Whether um, he chooses or not is up to him. And it's completely a mis complete misconception that you can earn your way in. Therefore, we just try our best and pray that Allah um, veils us with his mercy. Uh, subhanAllah. Yeah, that's, that is that's pretty that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, but we're going to get, as we're going through this ayah, how there is a responsibility that we're supposed to have. And that will be found next. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. Uh, um, surely my Lord has guided me to the straight path. I thought exactly actually continuing your point. My Lord has guided me to the straight path, a perfect way. The faith of Ibrahim, the upright. The Prophet وسلم, is told that Allah has guided me to the straight path. You need to say, and of course, this is all of us need to say. Well, how do we appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is when we say, Allah is the reason that I recognize Allah. Gets into that other understanding of um, it's a mercy from Allah that you recognize Allah, because that in and of itself is a mercy. It's and Ibrahim alayhi salam, by the way, the interesting thing is the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam is uh, by this point found three times in the Quran by Zurat al An'am. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, what is his story? He found Allah, right? What is it? Looked at the stars, looked at the sun, looked at the moon, said, These aren't my Lord, but no, like Allah is my Lord. He found Allah, but what does he say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, Allah guided me. What's what I want us to appreciate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how are we supposed to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah is the one who guided me. I want to clear up a misconception here though. There, I've seen this argument before, not that any of you ever um uh, uh have, have stated a question like this, but I've seen it in the past. Why would Allah want us to praise Allah? Like First, I would say, uh, well, human beings shouldn't do that, right? Like, we should be humble. Why would Allah do this? And I, first, the first line of defense there is, um, yeah, you should do that because you have. we all have reasons to be humble. Like, you do this and you can't see. <laughs> um, we, we catch you at a bad moment and you're a nightmare to be around. <laughs> like, if you don't have sleep for a day, like, we have every reason to be humble. Allah does not. So that'll be the first part of that reason. And then the other side is when Allah tells us to praise Allah, who benefits? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit? No, Allah even said, if all of you were to come together and ask of me, Allah's power doesn't decrease in one by one mo a small amount, or if everyone was to come together and deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's status doesn't decrease one bit. Who does it benefit when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When I say subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single time I say Allah, I am raising the status of Allah in my heart, in my understanding, so that I am more likely to behave in a way conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who benefits from you saying Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. It's not Allah, it's you. It's you and me. We benefit when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say Allah is the one who guided us, that's us getting further into guidance because it's an admission. You're, it's almost like saying my goal, I'm getting closer to my goal. 
when you say Allah guided me, Allah guided me and I'm getting closer to my goal. And as I'm getting closer, I keep recognizing who my goal is. And my goal is to what? To get as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible. Um, and surely my Lord has guided me to the straight path, the perfect way, the faith of Ibrahim, the upright, Hanifan. Hanifan, um, it comes from Hunafa. Hanafa is to turn away, actually. Um, and it's to turn away from anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like giving attention to no one other than Allah. Wa ma kana min al-mushrikeen. And was not someone who did shirk. And I'm going to translate it as uh, one who associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of saying the polytheist. Um, because like shirk is literally what? Associating or giving anything attention. Um, abs our absolute love other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, yesterday we talked about uh, 14, I, I, I posted in the chat for those that are interested, um, the 14 uh, different words for love and the meanings of them. Um, I know I went through only three or four of them in the actual lecture because I couldn't remember them, fasting brain. Um, uh, but um, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of what is shirk, shirk would be associating partners with Allah or giving that high level of love that's supposed to be given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to something else. And remember, what was that high level of love? I'm not going to go through all 14 levels or anything with you today, but I want you to think about um, how love and worship are at the end of the day, the same thing. That even in English, someone could love someone, someone could like something, someone could love something, someone could adore something. And then if you adore to the nth level, you worship someone or you worship something. Um, that's the type of love that's actually being talked about. The highest form of love gets into you worship it. Because that becomes literally the purpose of your life. You've given that to anything other than Allah, that's shirk. And Ibrahim salam, wasn't willing to give that attention to anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does this mean that he didn't love his children? No, of course not. Does this mean he didn't love his community? Of course not. When uh, uh, angels are being sent to give punishment, uh, Ibrahim salam, goes, no, let me go and talk to them. He had love for people. But... What takes at the end of the day the highest form of his love is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realizing it's 530 and we have four more ayat. But still, what reflections do I have? I'm just going to speed up a little bit. Uh, previously, when you were talking about um, entering into Jannah with Allah's mercy, it reminded me of how yesterday you talked about how anyone with a seed of faith will enter the Jannah, but you know, along those same lines, it reminds me of how anyone with a seed of arrogance will not enter Jannah. And I can, I like how the analogy is pretty much the same, but it's being used in a different context. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That, 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 uh, the hadith yesterday about intercession, um, about the Prophet uh, being given permission by Allah SWT to take anyone and who has even a seed of Iman in their heart. But the same thing can be of shirk if they are improperly placing um, their attention, that, that could be a problem as well. So yeah, definitely, I can see that connection. I appreciate you sharing that. And then along the lines of you talking about um, praising, it reminded me of how there was a companion of the prophet who wanted to be in his um, companionship, even in Jannah, and he said, help me with that by you know raising your status through constantly making sujood. So at the end of the day, it was helping him as a person so I think, you know, just like praising Allah just benefits us, us overall. And obviously it doesn't take anything, from, anything away from Allah, but it helps us raise our status in his eyes. Yeah. Allah. I saw a post. Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you. I have a question. Can we say that we're on the straight path or um, on like on the, like, is, is it okay for us to say that? Because we could be saying that, but at the same time doing lots of things that aren't on the straight path. That's a really, really, really good question. And I think, uh, say, I don't think we can ever say that I am on the straight, straight path. We can say that I think Allah is guiding me to this path. Like I, there, there should be, this is again, this is the Prophet I was saying, Allah has guided me to the straight path. The Prophet is being told to say that. Uh, for us, it would be a smaller version of it. Um, because again, we don't get wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we do get indications of good. Like sometimes when you do something, like it was hard in the beginning, but it's becoming easier for you to do. And you feel like, man, I like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with me. You can say, alhamdulillah. You can literally say that moment, like, I'm so happy that Allah guided me to this, this feeling to this moment. Got it. Thank you. 
yeah, I think that's just like Surah Fatiha as well. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Idi Nasrat al Mustaqim, right? It's it's a direct uh, kind of conversation of like guide me to the straight path. And when you feel like you've gotten some sort of guidance, you're allowed to say Allah guided me. Um, but it's not like I found the straight path. Woohoo! No, where does the attention go? It goes back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Because again, when the attention goes back to Allah, that's actually benefiting you. It is not benefiting um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yes, sir. Oh, I was just going to say that I remember seeing a post. I put, I put this in the chat, but I wanted, I remember seeing a post about um, having resistance and um, thinking that Allah will accept your du'as or that Allah will grant you what you ask for. But then the logic that debunked in that post was why would he have guided you to make that du'a if he didn't want to accept it or give you something better? And I remember also once someone had told me, like, if you randomly think of someone, just really bizarre, random thought about someone you haven't thought about in a while, just make dua for them because you don't know where that comes from. It could just be that Allah is trying to answer their duas through you and give you an opportunity to also earn reward from that. Yeah, subhanAllah. That's actually the subject of the khutbah. I've been, I think, all week usually of what a topic to have for a, the Jummah khutbah. And that's actually what the topic of my khutbah is tomorrow. And it's it's going to be along the lines of uh, sometimes we think of Ramadan of people like when we're doing stuff of people who aren't doing stuff. Um, and that gets to an improper style of thinking because you don't know whose dua you got guided from. So you don't know if you owe someone a dua <laughs> um, in that moment, or like you might be the reason, or you might be the one who's supposed to invite them. So like, don't judge someone. It, we need them. You know what I mean by that is like, we're all, all of our fates are intertwined with each other. We need to worry about the people who are in our lives, about the people we have access to. And we want them to succeed because if they succeed, we succeed. So like, don't see it like, ha, they're not doing this. Don't be like, hmm, what... A lot, so through some random person's dua, I got this. I need to pay, pay back the favor um, and, and make sure to not be in the way of anyone else uh, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's also good deeds that we wouldn't even know that we have, I would think, right? Like that's yeah. another mercy from Allah. I'm going to continue through with the, the next ayah, inshallah, 162. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with this. And this ayah, this is this and the last one are the ones that hit me and why I wanted to share this passage. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, uh, said, and we're supposed to say, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ this just hits so hard. Uh, say that my prayer, um, nusuki is uh, not my worship. I wouldn't translate it as that. I would say my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah Rabbul Alameen. The reason this hit me is this gets into what's the purpose of prayer. It goes from the smallest to the biggest in terms of what you have to offer, right? The first is salati. I sometimes even think about like, what are like micro intentions to macro intentions? Micro intentions are like, when do you practice niya? You practice niya when what? We're about to pray and you're like, okay, luhur for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing else matters right now. You're doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. Allahu Akbar. Like that's that's oftentimes what, <laughs> what the self-talk I have to give myself before I start. Right? Like, forget about the deadlines, forget about this, forget about everything. Again, listen to your heart for a second. Allah is greater. Okay, then we begin. Um, so, in terms of like that whole thing, you make your intention for it. But when you do that, that enables you to wanusuki. And again, Ibrahim is the one who said it my sacrifices. What did Allah ask Ibrahim to sacrifice? Literally, his safety, his family. Like these are sacrifices we could never do. And on a side point, that's why we celebrate Ibrahim. That's what we celebrate on Eid, by the way. Um, but I used to remember the question like Eid al-Adha, what are we celebrating? Because Ibrahim was able to sacrifice. What does that mean? And what, it, what Eid al-Adha means, what do we celebrate on Eid al-Adha is actually that a man was asked to sacrifice in his young age, um, being seen as a weirdo. A young person, one of the things they want to do is they want to fit in. 
But what did Allah ask Ibrahim alayhi salam to do? Yeah, your whole town, they're mushrik, but you still got to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's tough for a young person to do. When he gets a little bit older, his society wants to hurt him physically. The next level of harm you can have. When he gets older, asked to leave his family in a desert. Man, that is so tough. To lose your family, to be taken away from your family. And then the last is what? To sacrifice your son. The greatest loss a human being can go through in this life is to lose their child. Like even like saying it, like my, my voice crackles a bit because like you can only imagine what that, what that feels like. Um, and that's the greatest harm that could ever take over. But what do we celebrate on Eid? What do we celebrate on Ibrahim Salam? That through his worship of Allah SWT, or through his reliance on Allah SWT, he's even able to do the worst possible things or the not the worst possible thing, it'll go through the worst possible tragedies in his life. And why do we celebrate that? When you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter what test is thrown your way, your, your faith in Allah can take you through it. That's what we celebrate on Eid, which is what, what this faith can give you. What believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, can uh, give you the ability of going through. No, you're, never, you're not going to be commanded to leave your family, commanded to lose a child. But if it happened, Ibrahim alayhi salam is living proof that, you, that people can get through it, that this faith has the capability of getting you through it. So that's what's celebrated. That's what's found here as well, where if you're doing salah for Allah, that's training to do what? Sacrifices. Any harms you're going to get in your life. If Sometimes we have to sacrifice. So some of them we do willingly. Others of them we're forced to do. And some of these sacrifices are what? When we get older, maybe our health. Maybe our capability, our strength, whatever that is, wanusuki, willing to sacrifice it, wamahiyaya, and eventually it gets to the purpose of my life, and even wamamati and my death, lillahi rabbil alamin, that all of them become for Allah subhanahu wa taala, that the point of prayer was to do what, if I can take some time for Allah, I can make some sacrifices for Allah, I can devote my life to Allah. And eventually, my death for Allah. All of it, 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 it builds. So if then again, if, if it literally, if, if we did the transitive property, you could say, why do you pray? So that I could die for Allah. So that Allah is uh, um, going to be literally the return that I go to at, with my death. So what am I doing when I'm praying? I'm preparing for death. Again, it's, it's more beautiful than that because of what comes in between. Uh, but it, I, I would say it's pretty accurate. Um, your reflections. It reminds me of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it reminds me of how when people talk about, um, everyone wants to die saying the shahada and die a beautiful death, but people say in order to die that way, you need to live a certain way, right? So I think it basically reminds me of, um, you know, my death is for Allah. This is reminiscent of Prophet Ibrahim Islam's du'a when he was like, Hasbullah wa ni'mal wakil. You know, I put all my trust in Allah lives enough for me. That's how he practiced his life. It wasn't just words for him. That's literally how he practiced his life. And so therefore, at the end of the day, his death was for Allah because that's how he literally lived his life. So I think it's one thing to just kind of say that, you know, you know, my prayers for Allah, it's another thing to actually do things that show and exemplify that, you know, indeed my actions are for Allah. So how he jumped into the fire we can see, you know, that that can be seen in the lives of everyday Muslims today, where perhaps we're not exactly jumping into fires, but in terms of society, we may be doing things that society deems weird or, you know, abnormal or, um, you know, it doesn't exactly conform to societal standards, but we know that it's right. So, and then, inshallah, our deaths will be for Allah. Yeah, subhanAllah. That makes me think, and I, I love that quote, um, and I, I don't really like this movie very much, but I think the quote at the end of it is kind of cool. Um, anyone seen The Last Samurai? Um, it's 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 an okay movie, but it's, it's, a, it's a movie that was based off, it's like a, a story that's been told over and over again. Um, and uh, at the end of the movie, it, the the general has died um, and uh, the emperor of Japan goes up to Tom Cruise's character. It's got so much of this annoying white savior thing associated with, but anyway, he goes up to him and goes, will you tell me how he died? And he very dramatically 
in the way an action star is supposed to. I will show you how he lived. <laughs> so there is this, this whole thing of, and it's that typical quote: everyone wants to die for Allah, but no one wants to live um, uh, uh, in, in a way in a way of being obedient to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Because at that point, uh, death is seen as a more convenient thing. Like, I just want to do that. No, it's not. You're not going to be able to do that unless you've been living for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to begin with. But um, but what uh, Maryam, your comment really made me think about uh, was. Uh, each of us are going to have an impact in this world. And subhanAllah, some of you guys are going to end up being super amazing and successful in whatever career fields with your families that you're going to have. Um, and may Allah SWT grant all of you more success than you ever thought imaginable. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm old, so I, uh, like, I vicariously live through all of you. Um, but you're going to do some pretty awesome things. Go to some pretty amazing places. And the question to ask is, if I've been praying appropriately, like, what am I ready to sacrifice? And I don't mean this to say that uh, um, sacrifice means you need to abandon it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is more along the lines of like, what effect did my prayer have for me making the, uh, the, uh, the goal of my life being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever sphere of influence that I'm in, whether you're a movie director whether you're a CEO of a company, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a city planner, what did I do to do what? What was supposed to be the goal of my life? Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did I give to sh myself? Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also to provide the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa of the greater society to be raised. That's the archetype of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Was, he was always guided, but he was also always guiding. And that's what it takes, salah, to the things that you sacrifice, to literally the mission of your life, to what you will rem be remembered for when you die. mamati, For what? Lillahi rabbil alameen. For my Lord, the Allah, the one I love so much, the Rabbi, the one who literally was in charge of every part of me. Like everything I did, there's Allah who was arranging for it. But Allah didn't just do that for me of alamin of all types of creation. Like that's the question to ask of each one was supposed to be preparing you for what the next one is. And that's what Allah SWT is almost expecting of us is it starts with simple things like salah, but it eventually gets into literally Allah wants to be the goal of your life so that it becomes the legacy of your death. It's like dhikr. Um, I saw this one clip by Yasmin Mujahid and she said like the purpose of us saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah over and over and over again is not because we don't understand as human beings what it means or the significance. It's that our brains and our minds and the way we are, the only way we can really live and ingrain ourselves into this way of being is to repeat it it's if you tell yourself a lie over and over again you'll believe it and your brain will wire itself to believe it and you create neural pathways that will make it true the same thing applies for dikkat and anything else if you do enough repetition your mind becomes so wired and doing it it becomes your instinctual reaction so we have to take responsibility for training ourselves to be a certain way through the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us through his mercy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that point's also well stated in terms of uh, Allah says, Qul, say, because you force someone to say something like, <laughs> um, um, like I, I, I always like giving the parenting example because that's what's most accessible to me. Uh, but uh, sometimes my daughter, if I'm telling her something, which I know she's going to forget, I'll be like, say it, repeat it back to me. And then she'll go, I am Groot. I am Groot. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make the reference. <laughs> but that's how I sort of sometimes feel like she'll do. She'll repeat it and then it'll be either completely off <laughs> or she'll say it properly. But I'm like, okay, you didn't get it. Say it like this. <laughs> um, and it's it's usually things like playing with his her little brother too roughly or something. It's like, you can't do that. So what are you going to do the next time you're playing with him? He's like, I'm going to pick him up. I'm like, no, that's the opposite of what I said. You can play with him and you can't pick him up. 
Uh, but it's like, that's what we say to say. So say that salati, your prayer. Say that nusuki, your sacrifices. Say <laughs> what hayati. Um, Say mamati, you have to keep saying it because there's also a tendency of what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to forget and you're going to start doing it for something else. Your salah will be for other people because my parents want me to, because this needs to happen. Uh, my sacrifices will be so people will respect me. So this will happen. So I'll get a better job. So whatever the case may be. So I'm comfortable. Um, uh, um, uh, your life will eventually become that. Like, what is your life? You it's for every other reason it's for your nafs it's for status whatever the case may be and then we all like to think oh but at death though at that moment it'll everything will turn around no it won't if you didn't turn those three things beforehand you think your death is going to be for if you want that to happen you need to follow this pattern this is did someone else sorry go ahead no no go ahead um, I, this kind of reminds me of like the uh, one of the definitions that you said of love again in the uh, in the, a couple of the riots ago, and also realize how toxic the music industry is, because this is exactly how love is described towards a human being, and fantasized, and I never realized that how hardcore of a difference it makes when you like repeat those same words, but instead of for Allah, you repeat it for like someone else, another individual. So this is, this is, this I have to literally remind me of that. Allah, yeah, that's, that's very true. And remember, uh, um, anything that's calling you to use this pathway for anyone other than Allah, it is actually calling you towards shirk. So that's actually a very scary connection there. Yeah, definitely. I know I attribute these ayahs to, to being like a ring structure quite frequently, but I just, I couldn't really help it. So here, like it says, surely my prayer, and then it ends with my death, right? It reminded me of how when we give the adhan, it's usually given at the time of the person's birth and then at their janazah. So I just, I couldn't help but think that everything, their sacrifices and their life was in between, but it started off with the adhan and their, Salah, and then it ended with their death in the janazah. Oh, well, that's a beautiful connection. I really appreciate you making that. I did not think about that. Um, so much of, again, this is where consistency all, all across the deen and the sunnah of the Prophet lies to them. Um, that, that's pretty awesome. I'm going to move on. That, Mariam? Sorry. Go ahead, Isra. I was just going to ask if Mariam could repeat that. Uh, yeah, sure. I was going to, I was basically saying that how it started off with my prayer and then ended with my death, right? So everything else is in between. And it reminded me of how the adhan is given when a baby is born and then the adhan is given at their janaza. So it have, everything else happens in between, but it starts off with prayer and then it ends with their death. So that's why I think the fra phrasing is something like, you know, work towards building your salah and prayer until the adhan is given at your funeral or something along those lines. Because it starts with the adhan and then it basically ends with the adhan and everything else is just your sacrifices and your worship are leading up to your death. Got it. Oh, yeah. That, that's super beautiful. Um, um, go ahead. Uh, someone else is speaking, mm -hmm. then I'm going to move on to the next aisle. Um, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was that it says, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati. There are four, like, four words, but Mahya ya is it like an a uh ending versus all the other ones have like a pattern of e. And you actually said like wahayati. And if if that word was used, the pattern would have stayed, versus mahyaya kind of separates mm. life out of the four words that were used. Um I don't think that I fully comprehend like how significant that is, but probably it means something along that we have to focus on our lives now, but I don't think that that's a full understanding of how subtle but significant that little detail is. It probably is very significant. So, you know, what I'm going to do after this is I'm going to see if I can figure out the, um, 
I have no other better way of saying it, but other than the iambic pattern of this surah, because different surahs have different ones. Um, and if this breaks it or if it's found earlier, then oftentimes ayat link like that. So they link by the sound of the pattern. Um, again, it'll take me a long time to do it, so I can't do it right now. Um, but that could be what this is referring to. And I have a feeling that's what it is, because just when I'm looking at the next couple of ayat, um, it seems to follow a trochaic pattern. So it makes me think this breaks it for a reason because it's related to ayat that came before. So again, this is where we get into like deep structures of the Quran or deep patterns and just the sounds. That's a really cool observation though. That's really cool. I would love to hear what you come up with. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I actually didn't pronounce that properly. When yeah, yeah. Um, I said Hayati, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a lot. Yeah, I am going to have to look into what the significance is, but one we can say, looking right at it, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, it seems to be sticking out because it's the one that lasts the longest, right? You have salah, you have moments of sacrifice, and you have a moment of death. Haya, hayaya, even in the way you say it, it's longer than the rest of them because it's going to last the longest. So, yeah, pretty awesome. We're going to move on, inshallah. Uh, we have a, a three more ayats to go. La sharika lahu wa bithalika umirutu wa ana awalul muslimin. Allah has no partner, so I am commanded. And I am the first to submit. Don't like that translation. I would say, and first and foremost, the first and foremost part of me is that I am a Muslim. That's how I would translate it. Um, that uh, so you recognize that no, you don't owe anything to you don't worship anyone but Allah. Wa bi umirtu, and that's what I'm commanded. And what I'm because of that I am commanded. Wa ana awwala muslimin. And that the first part of me is that I'm a Muslim. Hope that makes sense. Um, and that's really what the goal becomes is why am I doing all of this? So that who is first in my life? The idea of my submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the primary definition of, of who I am. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to have other identities. You definitely are. Um, I don't like when people say like, you can't be a black Muslim. You can't be a this Muslim. You can't be a that Muslim. You can, you, you definitely can. You can carry other identities with you. But the one that is supposed to uh, um, be the most impactful, the one that you define the most or controls the most amount of your action is your Muslim identity. So it's like, can there be a Bangladeshi Muslim Students Association, an Arab Muslim Students Association, a Black Muslim Students Association? Can all that happen? Uh, yeah, sure. But can that be the primary focus of someone's life? No, no, no. The Muslim would have to come first uh, uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, so that's why, that's why I also think it's awalu, not uh, um, only would be what? I can't think of the Arabic translation for only, but it doesn't say only. Faqat. <laughs> That wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily flow verbiage wise, but you're right in terms of like, that's how you say that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't flow, it's, but that, that's another reason it doesn't work, though. Uh -oh. um, I, I want to make a comment. First of all, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum um, alaikum. So uh, it's a very subtle. I know it, it says, so it's saying like the word, if I remember correctly, it's been a while. Awalu is saying, like, it, it's kind of like the, like he was, I don't even have to shut that in the middle uh, between like, like let's say like ula right it's like it's kind of that word's being um made into a verb i believe or it's it, the subtlety here is, is such that it wasn't just like oh yeah i, I was just a muslim it's when i am made to be a muslim i'm sure you can elaborate more on that but it's just a subtlety i noticed yeah yeah um there's the idea of i am making it first so that's, I think, what you're alluding to here when it's ana awalul muslimin. When you look at it, that's three isms in a row, but that actually isn't an ism in the middle. That's I am making it first that I'm a Muslim. Right, right. Yeah, no, and that's a good, that's a good point to put out there. Um, again, grammar nerds, uh, look at form two. 
<laughs> of uh, uh, of uh, the, the term, and you'll appreciate that a little bit more. So it's it's being made to do something or exemplifying that a, a, aspect of it. So like kataba is to write, kataba is to make someone write or to really really write. Um, it can be used for both. Anyone else, any comments on this? Uh, I just think of, um, uh, you know, that, you know, the, the first part of the ayah, that he has no partner. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, it can kind of be hard to really fully realize that. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it is. And actually, Zishan, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because this is all part of the things we're supposed to say. Um, meaning that when you say something, it's a positive affirmation, uh, meaning that you say it because you're reminding yourself. Yeah, you say it at Umrah as well. And um, I think of like, you know, Umrah can be very hard. And, you know, that, that's just test, more of a testament to that the fact that this is like a hard um, thing to embody or to fully believe yeah yeah it's part of the the statements we say umrah is labbaik allahumma labbaik here i am allah here i am um and that's actually very similar to what ibrahim Islam says in the bible that whenever god calls on ibrahim he says i am here uh so here i am uh, allah here i am uh la sharika um that there's no partners to will with you or i ha i'm saying there's no part i i'm wanting to admit that there's no partners that's the only reason i'm here so yeah it's pretty beautiful Going to continue on. We have three more ayat, and I really want to get to 64, 165, or two more ayat. So that, that, that's that's good. Uh, um, so should I seek a Lord other than Allah? Uh, this is again how do you get yourself to in that mentality when there's no other person who is the Lord of everything, who has everything. وَلَا تَكْسِبُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ إِلَّا عَلَيْهَا No one will get any, any benefit except for whatever they actually placed or uh, brought forward. وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ Such a hard ayah to memorize, by the way. وِزْرَ <laughs> أُخْرَ Anytime there's one word conjugated many times, you would think it makes it easy, but it makes it so much harder to memorize. <laughs> May Allah help those that are memorizing Quran. I mean, um, no one will be burdened with anything other than their burden. Then to your Lord is your return, and your Lord will inform you of the differences. You know how we ask those questions at times of uh, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why is this person's life this way? Why is my life this way? Um, yeah, Allah will, Allah will tell you what the differences were, what really what the differences were. Your role was not to ever compare your burden with someone else's role. To you, their burden. To you, uh, to me, my burden. That's literally what it's supposed to be. You're not, you were never supposed to compare it. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put forward each and every one of us is your situation is unique, but the goal was what? That you're, the destination of everyone is the same, which is that you're all going to be coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you worried about kind of what you were told to carry, the capacity of things you were supposed to carry. Other people worry about what they have to carry. What, what do we keep need to reminding ourselves is, uh, is it, our destination is the same, right? Yeah, our destination is the same. You might have something, some more to carry than I do, but we're all heading to the same place. It's everything was a preparation to get back to what? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was supposed to be our return. And when we get there, bima kuntum fihi tarifun, um, then Allah subhanahu wa will tell us what what were the differences um, that, that you were going for? These ikhtilaf that you saw. Um, and something beautiful here. Uh, I didn't get into this, but right before these ayat, I believe it's 159, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and don't ever separate into, yufarraku, don't separate from each other. And here it says, takhtalifun, 
ikhtilaf uh, is difference, but it's difference that you're still willing to tolerate each other for. Barraqa is you have a difference and now we separate. You're allowed to have ikhtilaf with people. Totally fine. You shouldn't do farraqa. You shouldn't divide yourselves based on your differences. Um, so that's, a, that's more of a side point. But of the of what you, the differences you had, but as long as it made you still see each other as people and you're still returning to Allah, Allah, Allah will tell you what the actual purpose was. You know, like we wonder, are we ever going to understand like why this happened? Yeah, you will. Allah will tell you. This is why this happened. This is why you were challenged in that way. This is why you got into that car accident. Why? Because we prevented you from this. This was the blessing we intended you to, you to have for, or from it. This is why this test hit you at that time. Um, like Allah will be telling us all of that. So again, what does Allah want? The whole reason I chose the set of ayat is who is Allah? Allah wants to tell you. Allah wants you to succeed. Allah wants you to also recognize that your burden is your burden. Um, if, you, if you and I are living lives in which we're keep, we keep blaming other people for our circumstances, um, I have to ask, that's not the goal of Islam. Like if we're like, it's because of so-and-so, it's because of so-and-so, it's because of so-and-so. That doesn't mean that oppression doesn't exist. Oppression definitely exists. Like, and we're supposed to try to correct it. But if we're getting to the point of trying to free ourselves from responsibilities over and over and over again, Allah doesn't want you to free yourself from responsibility. Allah wants to see what you're going to do with your responsibility. Um, one of the ways you recognize, am I getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is am I becoming more responsible? Like understanding the burden that I have and recognizing Allah was the one who placed this burden on me. So I have to, what am I going to be judged on? My response to the burden that I have. Anyone else, any comments on this? And we'll finish inshallah, just like yesterday at around 6.15. Okay, about five, about 10 more minutes, inshallah. I can't help but think about um, for the past two or three hours, as we're talking about, um, we're talking about uh, how someone's life is for Allah and how someone's, uh, uh, and how like everyone like has to take into account or they'll be taken into account for their own burden. You know, I can't help, help but think about um, Imam Sayyid Sultan and and his, his um, and like and his and and his sort of experience with both living and with illness. And um, you know, if anyone hasn't read his reflections uh, on his blog, I highly, highly recommend uh, reading them. I can post a link on the chat. Yeah, if you could. Um, and may Allah give him and preserve his legacy and increase all the good that he has done and make him better in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than all of us know him. I mean, um, Imam Sahib Sultan is a, a dear friend um, uh, of a couple of you in here and, and myself as well, um, who is, has been battling stage four bile duct cancer for a year and um, is in um, hospice care at the moment. Um, so we, we make dua for him and I definitely urge you while I, before you're breaking your fast to spare a couple of your um, uh, uh, moments of dua to inshallah make dua for him um, and his family as they're going through a very, very difficult trial. But it goes to show that that difficult trial, you look at it as like, that's subhanAllah, that's the burden and that's the strength that Allah SWT has given him and his family to face. I was going to say, um, we were talking about how we're not supposed to compare our burdens because we, like each burden, the goal is different, but the destination is the same. That just returns us back to the idea of having faith in Allah that like we have different needs and different means of preparation to reach the same destination because we're all so different. And we have to trust that Allah is all-knowing and is preparing us in the way where we can return to him in our best form. So the way that looks for everybody is different. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And yeah, that's, that's where that trust comes in. And the last ayah really hits that exact point home is uh, that, Remember what we start this conversation started with that if a good if you do a good thing, it'll be raised by 10. If you do a bad thing, it's just one. 
the reason th the conversation starts with that is anything Allah puts you through, Allah wouldn't put you through something unless you had the ability of raising your ranks tenfold. Does that make sense? So you might ask like, why the trial? Because if you got through it, you had such potential. Allah's not doing it to punish you. Allah's not doing it to be rude or mean. Allah knows what you're capable of. So when Allah puts you through something, it's because you have the ability of super, like elevating yourself as a result of it. Because what does Allah want? Allah wants you to succeed. Um, other places in the Quran, we'll talk about this when we talk about the Akhirah um, subsection of uh, our uh, <laughs> time together, uh, is uh, Jannah is considered your inheritance. You don't make something someone's inheritance un unless you want them to have it. Like this is yours, but it could be, you need to pass the qualifiers because I know you're, you're capable of this. Um, and then moving to the last ayah for today. Um, Allah is the one who placed you as successors on earth and elevated some of you in rank over others. Um, uh, so he may test you what, with what he has given you. Surely your Lord is swift to recompense. Iqab is actually not used typically as adab, like in the hereafter. Um, but Allah is certainly the Ghafur the, Rahim, literally the one who wants to cover all of your faults and is the most merciful. It's, why I chose this, remember I said in the beginning that we went through 160 through 165 just to get through 165. Because in order to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, it's what test has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put forward? Allah expects amazing things from you. That's why you've been placed in the position that you've been placed. Um, I Some of you have heard me use this analogy before. I'm taking it directly from Jeffrey Lang. But Jeffrey Lang writes beautifully in terms of if you want to understand why some people go through trials and why maybe you might be going through trials. Um, Jeffrey Lang gives the example, and I have the same creatures in my house. So I'm going to use it as my example as well. Um, I have uh, three classes of creatures in my house. Um, I have, uh, I could actually say four, but let's actually yes, just use four. I have plants. Um, Adina gifted me a plant, which is still going alive well, alhamdulillah. Um, but what, what do my plants have to do? Stay alive. <laughs> like when I water them, I guess soak up water. Look, there's not a lot they have to do in order to keep me happy. And I, I get very happy by them, by the way. Like I really appreciate the plants. Um, like it brings me happiness to watch them grow. And when there's a little bit of yellowing or my cat starts eating my plants, I'm like, hey, hey, hey I want my plants to be healthy. Um, so there's them. And then there's my, I have fish in my house who bring me more happy happiness than my plants do because like you can kind of see them being happy uh, like when I feed them and stuff but generally what's my relationship to them uh, don't die and don't eat each other <laughs> that's basically it um, and if you do that you're ha like you're gonna make me happy a uh, little bit higher than that would be my cat who's sitting there right now like you mentioned me <laughs> um, uh, but my cat b bigger relationship she has the ability of making me happier in terms of literally like cats will sometimes surprise you like I've literally seen her when my daughter's asleep like take a blanket up to her there's the it's the cutest thing um and you're like whoa this cat actually cares about the people in my life uh but also my cat has the ability of making me annoyed more than like the fish or the plants ever could or <laughs> like scratching random things or like misbehaving because cats sometimes do that but I expect a little bit more but it gives me more love but then this wouldn't be a class of creature. I have my children who I expect way more from them. And the happiness they bring me doesn't even compare to the other classes of creatures so far, right? That, but then again, on the flip side, they could make me worried and hurt way more than the others could. That's a testament to how amazing they are. 
that's the approach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed successors. Khalifat al-Ard. What is insan to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's such a valued creation. And that's why there's an expectation because that's how much closer um, humanity is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's how much potential that humanity has. Um, uh, so it's out of love when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives guidance, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make us responsible for our actions. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will even say, we're going to talk about in the akhirah, there's going to be ayat about hellfire. Even that's out of love. That's out of mercy. Because there's an expectation that if you internalize this properly, you'll never go there. If you internalize this properly, um, it'll, it'll motivate you to do even better, to be what you're actually supposed to be. Because that's out of love and care. Um, so that's the idea of like, place your successors on earth to elevate some of you in ranks over others. Because what is this world going to do? It's going to show uh, you what you are actually capable of. Allah already knows what you're capable of. You're going to prove it to yourself. This is what you're capable of. You have the ability of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like yesterday, what we were saying, hey, look, my daughter came up. <laughs> that class of creature in my house. <laughs> um, uh, where, where was I? Sorry, I get distracted by her. She's too cute, mashallah. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, I, okay, okay, I got it back. So what's the point of any trial? What's the point of all of this is what? Because to see what you are capable of, to prove to yourself what you're capable of. Um, what this world will do at the end of the day will test you in a way. You're going to be hit with the test that for other people might have been easy, but for you is going to be difficult. And when you see other people's tests, that's why the ayah before this, two ayah before this, don't worry about other people's burdens. Because sometimes you'll see someone else hit with a burden and you're like so confused. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard for them? It would have been so easy. Yeah, because that's not your test. Your test is uniquely designed for you so you could understand how am I going to respond to my Lord with the test that I'm given? Because who's going to benefit from it at the end of the day? Allah is going to figure out which darajah you're supposed to be in. What, like the, the common expression in English, you're going to test your metal, right? Like you burn metal in order to see how pure it is, to see what it's actually made of. Your metal is being tested. Um, and at the end of it, what's the conclusion? Inna rabbi sari al aqab. Allah will be quick to I, punishment, isn't it? To give the um, uh, just kind of uh, consequence. Inna hu rahim. Allah wants to do what? Cover all your faults. Ghafur is typically put as a forgiving, but it's from ghafara. Ghafara is to cover, literally. Allah wants to cover all of your faults and give you rahim, give you immense mercy. Allah ends saying that at the end of the day, what does Allah want you to see Allah as as? Try your best. Whatever faults you have, bring them to. Totally fine. Allah is ready to cover them and Allah is ready to show mercy to you. You were supposed to just make an effort and try to take accountability. Try to make yourself a, a person who recognizes that like my burden is my burden. And I'm going to say, if I get guidance, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I do something bad, I take responsibility for it. Um, but Allah is that teacher who's on your side at, at every step of the way. I've been talking for a while. Reflections from you all. I like, oh, go ahead. I like how um, throughout the whole process of like learning more about um, his, uh, Allah himself and um, his description and stuff, there's like a concept of healing when it comes to your anxiety and depression and stuff like that. Um, I feel like throughout, like at, at one point of my life when I wasn't close to Islam, um, I felt like, you know, the worry of the future really, really got to me and stuff like that. And see, reading about his description in the Quran and stuff like that really helps as to what the purpose of my life is, why I'm doing, why I'm going to college, even when it comes to like small things like that, mm -hmm. it helps a lot to like calm that part of that side of me and kind of look forward as a, as a life as like kind of like you know going in a train ride and seeing all these beautiful beautiful things and Allah is the one who's conducting the train pretty much Allah. there's uh, you said it very very beautifully so I'm not going to try to recant what you said but um, it reminds me of a saying I forgot which philosopher said it but religion is the uh, um, uh, the, the, the flavoring to an otherwise bland life or another way like you know, other philosophers have called it that it's uh, 
um, your concept of God will be your way of uh, having a redemptive suffering rather than just a destructive suffering. Because um, it gives you understanding that I can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of this. Allah will actually make this argument in another place in the Quran that you're going to be going through this life. Why wouldn't you use it to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because everyone is going to be suffering at some point. Use it for its actual purpose. Um, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, Stephen, we, uh, would you like to add anything? <laughs> Love to have you on, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'd just like to add, it's lovely to see you. Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> Likewise, Ramadan Kareem. Anyone? Any concluding remarks as we uh, close for the day? You know Kohlberg's theory of moral development, how he's got like different levels of it's mostly through like as a child grows into adulthood how their concept of responding to consequences is different or doing the right thing so when someone's very young their idea of not doing the wrong thing is oh because I don't want to get in trouble but what I find interesting is that it's not really about age you'll find people even as grown adults that will do something or not do something to avoid punishment as opposed to just because it's ethically the right thing to do. And you mentioned earlier that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Jahannam out of his mercy so that we can internalize it properly and use it as a source of motivation. As in he covers all spans of people that could process motivation in different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone that responds to fear of punishment, it's there. If you're someone that responds to love of love and motivation, he has that as well. If you're someone that responds to understanding another aspect, he has that also. So it targets every single person and every single way of processing information as well. Yeah. Not a lot. It's almost as if Allah made us. <laughs> what a thought. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's beautiful. Um, uh, we're actually probably gonna uh, be going over Surah Al Hajj, Ayah 77 and 78. And that's the major theme of that, um, of that subsection. I just think it's funny how you take all these science classes and then you realize, well, we've known this for a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and inshallah, I think on that note, we'll conclude. Um, so these have been ayat uh, 160 through 165 of Surah Al-An'am. Um, and we're, again, where we are in the series that we're on is we're talking about major themes in the Quran. And yesterday we did ayat al-Kursi. The day before we did a couple of ayat from uh, Surah Yunus. And the point of this whole series is we're trying to understand the major themes in the Quran. We're spending about three to four days on each of the major themes. And the major themes, I will do a conclusion with them, uh, are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the signs of Allah. That's what we're on right now. And tomorrow we will be spending some time. I'm not sure on which ayah yet, but I'm planning on reading Surah Al-Nur tomorrow. So you could probably imagine which ayah I'm going to end up choosing. Um, so that'll that'll be tomorrow. And then we'll spend one more day talking about Allah and Allah's signs. And then from there, we'll move on to revelation and prophethood. We'll spend a few days on, on different subsections of the Quran that primarily deal with that. Then we'll be talking about human, uh, human beings as individuals, human beings as a society, um, nature and how it points towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a model for what being submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks like. Um, what keeps us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, eschatology, the idea of the akhirah. And last is a working model of human beings or the Muslim ummah who's supposed to be, what's the system that allows people to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single moment. So those are the eight themes that we're working with. Um, and inshallah, tomorrow we're going to continue our conversation about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with another section of the Quran. Jazakallah khairan, everyone. Really appreciate all of you being here. Those of you that participate or those of you that participate with your silence, really, it, it, it means quite a bit um, uh, for, for you to be here. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to, in this month of the Quran, this month of Ramadan, to get closer to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than we have been in the past so that our actions and our thoughts and our feelings towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allow us to become closer and be raised in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they reach a new height that they were never able to reach before. I mean, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.